Hi. Um, wow, I'm so honored to be here. This is so exciting. Uh, the first Compassion uh, Symposium. Uh, so my name is Kristen Neff, and I'm at UT Austin. And uh, you might say I've kind of devoted my career to the study of self-compassion. And I wanted just to tell you a little bit about how this came about. Uh, it was actually my last year of uh, my doing my PhD at Berkeley, and I was pretty stressed out. So I thought I'd try some Buddhist meditation to see if that would help. And the very first night I went to this Buddhist group, the leader talked about the importance of being compassionate to yourself as well as others. Uh, and it was like a light bulb went off over my head, you know, but you're allowed to be nice to yourself. This is a desirable thing. Um, and so I, I pretty much immediately started trying to be kinder to myself. Um, and it's not an exaggeration to say that it, it changed my life. It really changed how I related to myself and therefore how I, how I was able to relate to my life experience. Um, after uh, going to Berkeley, I did a postdoc with one of the um, country's leading self-esteem researchers. I don't have too much time to go into this, but basically started learning about the problems with self-esteem, um, like the fact that we all have to be special and above average to feel okay about ourselves, et cetera, like very, uh, very comparative with others. And I thought self-compassion was such a nice alternative. It's um, a really positive, really pro-social way of feeling good about oneself. So uh, when I got to UT Austin, I decided, well, I want to study self-compassion. Um, I had no idea how or where to start. So uh, the first thing I did is I thought, well, we, I need to try to define what self-compassion is, because at this point, it, it hadn't been defined in the academic literature. So where I turned, where it was talked about most, um, you know, from the tradition I was starting to practice was the Buddhist literature. So I, I read every book I could get my hands on that talked to some degree about self-compassion. Um, and I came up with an operational definition, um, which is a three-component model of what self-compassion is. All right. In some ways, I was lucky that self-compassion hadn't been studied so much, because I could start with my definition <laughs> and then work from there. And I think it actually did make it easier for me to, to try to measure it. So the first component of self-compassion, I would, I would argue, um, is perhaps the most obvious, and that's um, treating yourself with real kindness as opposed to self-judgment. Just like you would treat a friend, um, a very caring, supportive attitude. Um, but again, more than just being kind to yourself, act actively soothing and comforting yourself. Um, as if a friend came to you and said, oh, I blew it on this big work assignment, you'd probably give your friend a hug or you know, some, some uh, gesture of comforting and soothing. So to me, that's key, um, a key element of self-compassion. Um, this, to me, is really important. A lot of people have talked about this element here at this conference. Uh, not that many people, Erica did just now, um, include that in their actual definition of compassion. But for me, the sense of common humanity is central to uh, what compassion is. So realizing that the shared human experience entails suffering, entails imperfection. Um, oftentimes, I think, when we make a mistake or notice something about ourselves we don't like, or something really um, bad happens, we think, this shouldn't be happening. Something has gone wrong, right? It feels abnormal in some way, as if everyone else in the world has these perfect happy lives, and it's just me who has this problem. And that creates a real sense of isolation, of disconnection from others. Whereas if you frame your experience in light of the shared human experience, suffering can actually be a way to connect you with others, as opposed to isolating you from others. And then the last component, I really feel that you need some mindfulness in order to be self-compassionate. In other words, you need to notice your suffering. Um, oftentimes, we're so lost in self-judgment or problem-solving, we don't even really tune into our own pain. Uh, but you have to do that mindfully. In other words, you have to be able to turn toward the pain, uh, be with it, but also not exaggerate it, run away with a dramatic storyline of, oh, how terrible this is. So seeing your suffering as it is, no more and no less. So coming from that definition, I thought, all right, how am I going to measure this? Well, I'll create a self-report scale. Um, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. This is not my background. This is a stab in the dark, really. But I had a colleague who had some experience with creating scales. So I generated a lot of items that I thought represented those uh, three components. 
and I came up with um, the self-compassion scale, which is a 26-item scale uh, that measures these elements, both their positive and negative ones. Um, I'll just kind of let you read some of those examples, but self-kindness versus self-judgment, common humanity versus isolation, mindfulness versus over-identification. So they're really kind of self-report uh, measures of how you treat yourself uh, when things are difficult. Um, and the scale, uh, basically, I, I, I have these subscales, but I'm really interested, you might say, the emergent property that comes out of the intercorrelations between these subscales, what I, it's, which is what I call self-compassion. And psychometrically, there is a higher order factor that can explain this. Um, the scale is pretty reliable, I won't go into that, but what I was really um, excited about is there a fairly good convergent validity. So in other words, the, the scale is measuring something that other people can see. So in one study, we had um, uh, just one session with a the therapist. They were doing a two-chair exercise, if you know what that is. Uh, and after that session, the therapist rated what they thought the client's self-compassion level was. <clears throat> Sorry. And then we got their self-compassion level. And it significantly correlated after like an hour's contact. And then we did a study with uh, partners in a long-term relationship. Um, the study was really about, do self-compassionate people, are they better relationship partners? The answer is actually yes. Um, but what was interesting here for these purposes is we had people fill out their own self-compassion level. And then using the exact same scale, you know, how do you think your partner behaves using the same items? And the correlation was 0.70. So obviously there's something going on, I'm probably using a lot of our negative self-talk or compassionate self-talk out loud that other people can observe. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in using the scale, we got a great new 12-item short version that correlates almost perfectly <laughs> with the long version, so don't bother with the long version unless you're interested in the subscales. Um, it's been translated into a lot of languages. A lot of languages aren't even up here. These are just published studies. Um, so it's being used all over the world um, with uh, basically from adolescence on to uh, old age. Just, you know, real smattering of some of the findings. Um, Self-compassion is very strongly related to um, decreases in negative emotions or uh, states like depression, anxiety, stress. Um, but equally strongly related to positive emotions like happiness, optimism, life satisfaction. Okay, so it's a very good um, predictor of mental health. Now, having said that, you know, I've got my scale, but there's a lot of other ways to, to measure um, self-compassion and compassion in general other than scales. And I really believe we need multiple modalities to get at this thing we're calling compassion. So I just wanted to take you through a few recent studies. Um, uh, one is a, a great new study on divorce by David Zabara and his team. Um, so what he did, he was conducting a larger divorce study, and as part of that study, he had people give a five-minute stream of consciousness uh, in the early stages of the divorce, just talking about what was going on for them. Then he had graduate students rate Using, my, using the short form of the self-compassion scale, rate the behaviors that were, or the um, thoughts and behaviors that were expressed in that stream of consciousness, you got very high inter-rate reliability. So again, there's something that's observable going on here. Um, and he found uh, self-compassion was really the strongest predictor of anything he looked at in explaining adjustment nine months later. Um, this is a study that just came out like a month ago. Um, it's on my website if you're interested. It's a great study. Um, looking at improvement motivation. Um, the number one block to self-compassion is people think if they're too self-compassionate, they'll lose their motivation. And this study in a lot of data actually shows just the opposite. Um, so this is by Juliana Breens at, um, at UC Berkeley. And just to give you an example of one of the studies, um, they asked uh, subjects to talk about a past moral transgression. And then they had a condition where um, half the subjects were assigned to a self-compassion mood induction, a writing task. The other controls weren't given this instruction. Uh, so it asked them to think about a time they had um, really made a mistake or some transgression that they feel, felt bad about, felt guilty about. And just the simple, inst yeah, the simple instruction uh, to write a paragraph to yourself expressing kindness and understanding regarding the event you just described above. Okay. 
Um, and so that very short little uh, prompt, get them in a more self-compassionate mood, led to um, more not self-reports, mind you, not helping behavior. So who knows if this would translate into the real wor world, but self-reports of a greater desire to make amends and a greater commitment not to repeat the same mistake. Okay. Um, this is also, I think, a very interesting study. Um, they did a very short-term self-compassion training to see if that would impact, in this case, they were looking at depression. Um, this is a large internet sample, as participants mainly recruited through Facebook. And uh, this, such a small intervention. For seven days, they asked participants to write a one-paragraph compassionate letter to themselves. Okay, and so this is, these were the instructions. Um, and instead of reading it out loud, I'll let you read it, because it's quicker to read it yourself. Okay, so um, writing a letter like this, just a one paragraph letter for one week, um, significantly reduced depression, and this lasted up to three months. And then significantly increased happiness, and this lasted up to six months. And they actually didn't look at this beyond six months. So a very short uh, training intervention can have measurable effects on well-being. I'm really ahead of time. This is great. <laughs> Save some time. Um, so then uh, the other, this is really where most of my attention has been lately, is uh, a long-term training program in self-compassion. Uh, so my colleague and I, uh, Chris Germer, have developed an eight-week protocol to teach self-compassion, which is similar in structure to the um, Compassion CCT program we heard about, similar instruction to, MB to MBSR. I don't know why eight weeks is the magic number, but we just wanted to, you know, <laughs> follow the crowd. So eight-week intervention, meeting for two and a half hours every week. Um, where we do pe teach people formal meditation practices like loving kindness practice, um, a compassionate body scan, uh, practices like that. We also do a lot of informal practices, which are um, also very key. Probably the easiest, simplest one is God, I'm on time. teaching people to put their hands over their hearts and just really feel that, that warmth and gentle pressure when they're suffering. And it's amazing how powerful it is when you drop out of your body and you give yourself physical compassion. So a lot of exercises like that. Um, a lot of interpersonal exercises, talking in small groups, which is so key for engendering the sense of common humanity. Oh, you mean you, you talk that way to yourself too? You feel that way as well? It's a real eye-opener for a lot of people. Um, and then we give various homework exercises. Uh, so we just did a randomized controlled trial, weightless controlled trial, but still better than nothing. Um, and we found a really whopping increase in self-compassion, okay? Um, like a 35% increase in self-compassion over the course of the eight weeks uh, compared to the control group. I just have to say the control group also significantly increased self-compassion, but obviously not as much as our group. We found out later that they were reading um, my book and Chris Germer's book. <laughs> so our books are scientifically proven to raise self-compassion levels. <laughs> So anyway, but obviously the being in the group worked a lot better. Um, it also raised mindfulness. We do teach some mindfulness in the program because again, you, you kind of have to have some mindfulness to open to your own suffering. Um, also increased compassion for others. Now we didn't train this explicitly at all, but this still was an effect of the program kind of showing that these two um, are linked in some way. Um, again, very uh, large uh, improvements. These are actually decreases in depression, anxiety, stress, uh, emotional avoidance. And um, increases that again in positive emotions, uh, well, it's only life satisfaction that was significantly more than contr the control group, just because again, being on that weightless control <laughs> increased people's sense of connectedness and happiness. You know, I guess because they're assuming they're going to be in this, uh, in this group, group very soon. Or maybe it's because of our books, who knows. Um, and then we followed people up to a year later, and all well-being games were maintained. Um, so this is self-compassion here. Uh, all of them were maintained. Life satisfaction actually had a little um, t tick upward, was a significantly greater one month, uh, one year later than right after the program. So obviously this is something that people were integrating in their daily lives um, and getting a lot of uh, benefit from. 
So this is actually my last slide. <laughs> um, just, I just thought of when I was giving this talk that, you know, I'm just curious. I know there's a lot of self-compassion research out there. Let's just see the pattern. So this is really informal. I just did a Google Scholar search. Um, these were dissertations and journal articles that either look primarily at self-compassion or include self-compassion as an outcome, like maybe an outcome of a meditation training. And you can see it's, you know, it's really catching on. There's this exponential growth curve in studies of self-compassion, um, which is, I don't know, just makes me very happy. <laughs> and uh, happy, again, that people like you all are so interested in uh, compassion and the study of it. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>